done a little bit of public speaking before, but nothing quite like this, nothing quite this personal. So uh, when Teresa asked if I'd be willing to do it, I said, sure. She said that I could prepare a slideshow, and then I went to try to prepare a slideshow, and I was like, well, how do you tell a story that's this personal? Uh, and I thought, well, I'll... I, I would just put up a couple of pictures, um, then just kind of try to recount. Uh, really, it's it's combination of uh, three stories. It's my mom's story as the patient. It's my dad's story as the primary caretaker, and then it's my story uh, as as the son. So. Um, I live in Nashville now, but I grew up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, my uh, my mom was diagnosed with fatty liver disease late 2013, early 2014. She had been admitted into a hospital for um, a blood clot in her lower intestine. She had experienced severe pain. Uh, we had gone to primary care uh, and other doctors, uh, and eventually she was admitted through the emergency room, uh, Methodist Medical Center in Oak Ridge. And um, she they were doing all types of scans and had put contrast into her system so that they could do a scan in order to identify where the clot was located. And after she came out, after they had identified where the clot was, uh, all of a sudden she was retaining a, a lot of fluid. Her kidneys began shutting down uh, and her personality began shifting a lot. Um, she had started building up ammonia uh, from then, from what we were later told was from her uh, from NASH from her fatty liver disease. So she at that in that same hospital stay uh, eventually uh, became hepatic encephalopathic. Uh, I don't know if that's the correct way to pronounce that, but she got all to all the way to stage four where she went into a coma for. Um, 24 to 36 hours. She came out of that eventually, and we, my, and when I say we, it's my dad, myself, and I have an older sister, and we were not really sure what that meant. <laughs> like, what what does it mean that she has liver disease? What what does it mean that uh, she she has scar tissue on her liver and that it's not functioning like it's supposed to? how does ammonia come into play? Uh, all those different questions that we had, because we were just totally unaware, we, we didn't know. And so, uh, eventually, life, um, it, never retain, it, it never returned to normal. Uh, she would stay on lactulose uh, indefinitely, as well as other medications, and we would begin regular checkups on her MELD score and things like that. But for all intents and purposes, we thought that she was going to be able to live a relatively normal life. We didn't realize that her liver had already gotten to the point where she was she was going to need to do something. Um, so she resumed driving. She she resumed work. Um, she resumed kind of a normal day to day life as much as she could uh, for the next five years. Um, I was away at college uh, as, as well as my sister, and so it was just my dad. And I would call back home while I was in college, and occasionally hear stories about how my mom was maybe a little bit confused, or uh, she was having a really you know, she was having issues with being able to make it to the bathroom in time with the lactose that she was taking. Um, and so there'd be an occasional accident or something like that. And I thought, I, I, I always was very aware that she was very sick and that at some point something's going to happen, but I was thinking years down the, down the line. So eventually, uh, it's, it's 2019. She's been diagnosed for about five and a half years been living with liver disease. We had had a few hospital stays. We'd gone in and, uh, to the emergency room at least two or three times because she would go periods without taking her, her lactulose. And so she'd build up the ammonia, uh, become so confused and so drowsy and lethargic uh, that my sister and I, I, I don't know why it was just us, but both times 
we were the ones to pick up on it and realize, hey, her ammonia is high. We need to get her in. We need to get her treated. And so we took her into uh, the emergency room those two times. And then the last time was in 2019. Um, my dad took her to the emergency room this time. And she, she was, it was just very obvious that physically she was a lot weaker. She was a lot more lethargic. She was a lot more confused. Uh, and all of a sudden we get hit with the news that she had between three months to a year to live. And we were totally caught off guard. Um, we were not involved with any of the patient advocacy programs that we've talked about some. Uh, we were uneducated on the disease uh, to a certain extent. We didn't know really what right questions to ask. And we didn't do a lot of the same research that we probably should have to find support groups, to find additional information about transplants. Um, we were kind of dependent upon doctors and the healthcare system to really provide all that to us. And um, I think that there was some misunderstanding between my dad in particular and our physicians because he was dependent upon them. And I think that they were making the assumption that he was, he was doing a lot of that research himself. And unfortunately, um, we, we get to that point where she's told her timeline, uh, she has a year left and the doctor was spot on from that point that her last, her last, I'd say like semi normal hospital admittance, where she was treated for high ammonia, sent back out, uh, she started to decline rapidly. Her MELD score had remained consistent, um, but her liver was failing. So we were, see, so we were very confused um, and still wondering if a transplant would ever be on the table. About six months into that, Last year, we we finally started seeing the writing on the wall that a transplant was never really going to be an option. Um, she was she had maintained uh, obese weight. She had uh, she was diabetic, and she had a history of not taking her lactulose, uh, and so even though we kept following up with nurse practitioners. Um, and, uh, and occasionally a hepatologist, um, we, we weren't really ever going to get a transplant. Um, and so about six months into that last year, we started having to really turn everything on a dime and start thinking about, okay, well, what does, you know, what are we going to do? What does quality of life look like? So this really transitions into what I want to talk about, what my dad was going through. So my dad was primary caretaker and he, because we were not involved in these support groups and because we were unaware really of how the, this disease really progresses um, and where my mom was at on that progression, uh, he was blindsided um, and he was... Um, he was powerless over the, the way that the disease was going. Um, he, uh, he would try to get an appointment with any doctor that he could. He was trying, uh, within that last year, trying to research as much as he could. Um, but he didn't have other patients. He didn't have any caregivers in which he could interact with, get support from. Um, and so, when I asked him yesterday about his experience during that time, all he could really say was that it was the most, it was the loneliest he'd ever felt in his life and the most tired and exhausted mentally, emotionally, spiritually he'd ever felt in his life. Um, he was, he was out on an Island. Um, and, um, 
unfortunately, that was all happening during 2020, uh, right in the middle of a pandemic as well. Uh, so throw a healthy dose of lockdown and uh, isolation into all that. And uh, it, was, it was an extremely lonely time for him. My mom was eventually admitted into uh, an NHC facility in Oak Ridge uh, in August of 2020 after my dad had attempted to try to take care of her by himself in our home. My sister had moved uh, moved back home for a few months during 2020 um, and my, my grandmother had tried to help my dad some as well. Uh, but for the most part, my dad was truly on his own trying to work full time and, and trying to, to take care of my mom. Um, and he, he couldn't do it. Uh, it, it, it was not going well. Um, he would have outbursts of, of rage because he was scared and lonely and tired. My mom was confused, uh, and irritable. Uh, and so, I mean, my mom, who was never, never physically abusive or anything, uh, got to the point where she and, and my sister got into an argument just because my mom was irritable and, and my mom slaps my sister repeatedly um, because of the, the disease had progressed to that point. Um, so it was a helpless situation. Um, for people that were not prepared for, for that. So when she got admitted to the NHC facility, it was sad, but also at, at, on, on one, one hand, it was a huge relief because eventually my dad could get some sleep. Uh, there were other people that were more equipped to be able to take care of her, help her, help her get the resources that she need needed. Um, but the saddest part was being able to realize that this was that we're nearing the, the end of the road. Where a year ago we had been anticipating that my mom might be able to get a transplant in five or so years, we had to shorten our timeline down to where okay, she's got a year left to six months left to we can eventually we're having to put her on hospice and just waiting for whenever this is gonna reach the end of the end of the road. Um, and so eventually, uh, after she'd been admitted into NHC in August, um, in early November of 2020, she, she passed away and, um, it was, it was during 2020. So I, I have a picture. I didn't think nor would really want to put it up, but I took a picture because, my dad was inside her room uh, in HC with a nurse covered in all of the PPP gear. And um, my sister and I had to wait outside. We were looking in through a window um, as my dad was saying bye to, bye to our mom. Um, and then we had to watch as she, she got put... Uh, on the gurney, saw them put her, put her, cover her and everything. And so I don't want to have to, I don't, I don't want to ever go through that again. And I don't want other people to have to go through that again. Um, I, I don't know if I have liver disease. I know that my sister just recently uh, got got diagnosed with it, but is managing it. Um, she, they caught it very early. So she's just made lifestyle changes and, and is living a much healthier lifestyle. Um, but after experiencing that and, and going through that with my dad, having to watch my mom suffer like that, and then just having to experience that from at a fairly young, early age, um, I would like to be able to, to advocate more for patients and their families. Um, I, uh, 
I'm not in healthcare. Uh, I'm, I'm in accounting and finance. Um, I can't say hepatic encephalopathy very easily, <laughs> along with a lot of the other words. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, ha I do have a story um, that I hope can resonate with, with others. Uh, it's unfortunate that it doesn't have the super happy ending yet uh, for that I think a lot of other transplant patients have. Um, but it's one that I think a lot of people can at least resonate with. Um, and so I, I am very appreciative to Teresa for putting this event together. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of this organization. Um, I think that it has a great opportunity to be able to help a lot of people. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm thankful and grateful to be able to be a part of it. So apologize if that was a little bit rambling. Hope it made a little bit of sense. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to share. I'm Nathan. Okay.